have, or even if it's affecting a significant percentage of guns that gun owners actually have and have to return. Again, it's not taking all the guns out of the hands of gun owners. So for the purposes that gun owners require their guns for, they certainly have guns that are available for them to do that. If the argument here is that, um, is it actually stopping gun crime? Um, I mean, an argument could be made because every gun that you take out of the hand of a, a, legal, a legally, legally owned gun that you take away, despite the fact that it might seem like you're punishing the, the person who is doing it legally, it still reduces the risk of that gun either ending up in the hands of an illegally owned person, and it still reduces the risk of that gun being used in illegal activity, right? Let's hand it over to Constantinos for a, for a rebuttal. Sure. So I'm glad that you mentioned the, 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 the difference between banning a certain amount of guns or a certain percentage of guns while still allowing most gun owners to have access to other guns, making the argument that you're not banning all the guns. And this is the same situation that happened in Australia. So I figure it to be fair that you brought up the United States as an example in comparison. It would be fair, even more fair, because they're still a Commonwealth country, as is Canada, the nation of Australia had a, an almost all right ban, very similar to the one that's being implemented now in this order in council. They actually tried to ban assault style rifles in 1996. And in 1996, they did just that. They banned every assault style rifle that they could. And they showed, the statistics show and the study shows, and Gary Pleck, who's one of the most prominent criminologists in gun uh, studies and in gun examination and investigation uh, for over 20, 25 years, did a critique of this gun ban in Australia. And his findings were that the gun ban that was implemented by the government in Australia did not actually effectively stop mass shootings. It actually, gun violence went up, gun crime went up after the ban. And the same thing has been done in the United Kingdom, in the D District of Ireland, in the, uh, the Republic of Ireland, sorry, and in, and in Jamaica, okay? In Jamaica and in the Republic of Ireland, they outright banned all guns and they saw an increase in firearm usage. In fact, a large increase in firearm usage. That was so in the, the Dr. Mauser uh, report. That was in the Dr. Mauser report. Yeah. And it shows in the other report, the critique of the Australian gun ban. The, the idea was we're not going to ban all the guns, like you're saying. We're still going to leave you with some, but we're going to take away these ones that we deem dangerous. But that showed that there was no difference whatsoever in mass shootings. There was no difference whatsoever, at least not a decrease in, in, in crimes committed using guns, um, you know, legally, uh, illegally, sorry. So the, the, the idea that a prohibition or a ban, whether it's all or none, or I mean, sorry, all or some, it's hard to determine whether it's effective. Um, at least in Canada, we've seen there's no scientific study that shows a, a, a restriction or any type of legislation against gun ownership has had a positive effect on gun ownership because as we've seen, gun violence has increased over the, over the years in the 90s. And there was, a, there was a ban in 1970 something with the Firearms Act, that was the major legislation. There was amendments to that, adding more restrictions in the 90s. And it still um, has shown no significant increase or decrease in uh, gun related violence. So, I mean, there's tons of, there's tons of, research there's tons of uh journal articles out there not only in north america but across the world and it's kind of hard to compare such a large uh a large idea of gun control gun uh, ownership the inclusion of the second amendment how we can compare the second amendment to what's going on in canada the different types of gun legislation but i think to direct it towards the topic of today in relation to the gun ban or the ordering council that was implemented, I'd like to make a few comments on how it was implemented, the timing, the legality of it, and what was going on in general in Canada at the time. To begin with, the ordering council came off on the heels of the incident that occurred in Porta Peak. We, we've established that three out of the four guns that were found in possession of this individual were illegally owned Actually, all were legally owned, three of which were um, imported from the United States. I so believe the fourth one, was, uh, sorry, I just believe that the fourth firearm was obtained from the, the killed RCMP officer. Okay. So we're not going to ban guns from the police officers like the United Kingdom, because I think that's a bit silly. And evidence has shown that gun violence is still very high. In fact, they've also now banned 
the import of knives in the United Kingdom because they now have a knife problem because they don't have the gun problem anymore. Yeah, so, but, hold on, I mean, hold on. Okay. Let me just finish up what I'm saying about the discussion on the ordering council. So the ordering council came on the heels of this incident because of what happened. Trudeau said that because of what happened, we need to go through with the implication of invoking a firearm ban in some capacity. And this was something that he was harping on um, in the previous election. That was something that got him a lot of votes on his uh, you know, democratic uh, uh, voter uh, side. So the gun, the gun prohibition, the ordering council that was implemented was in fact um, done in a time of parliamentary recess, as Dan made mention of earlier. So parliament was not actually in session. The House of Commons for legislation to go through usually has to uh, you know, be written in as a, as a white paper. It goes through various uh, committees. It looks, it's looked at on either side. It becomes a green, a green paper. It gets final assent. It gets royal assent later on. It becomes it a bill. It goes through the Senate as well, but yeah. Yeah, so it goes through both, both House, the House of Commons and the Senate. Same thing in the United States, very similar in the, in the United Kingdom. So in order to have legislation come into, in, into play, it usually has a process. And these processes take usual months, if not years, of back and forth. The issue with an ordering council, the same thing with an executive order, the reason why an ordering council is ever implemented is in times of immediacy and urgency, in times of emergency. And so an ordering council imposed during a, during a pandemic, a global pandemic that has shut down the globe as a whole, the global markets have been shut down directly by the effects of government for the first time in history, which we mentioned in our last debate. The government went through and used this incident in Porta Peak as their emergency. Now, I'm willing to contend that this is not a national emergency, that this is not the type of emergency that requires immediate action on the government's part to pass legislation that completely overhauls and amends current legislation without the review of the specialized committees that usually go through with looking at this type of stuff. Right. And so he passed it, the prime minister passed it on his own accord through the recommendation of members of his council without the proper empirical evidence and statistics that have been you know, cultivated over time and without the proper back and forth dialogue that is expected in the democratic society of Canada. So with that having occurred, I find great issue with the reason and the way it went through. And as Ian mentioned earlier in the beginning of, the, of this debate, he said that there's, a, there's a, um, a law firm in Calgary, Alberta, that has proceeded with uh, the CCFR to actually implement a lawsuit against the government directly for uh, judicial review and they're making a claim for certiorari which is when the supreme court if it deems it necessary can actually look at the legislation that was implemented in and, this and, case and the federal court pardon in this case the federal court because this will be a first instance occurrence okay so in case in, so in this case it would be the federal court and if it needs to then later on at the highest level of federal court Red federal court federal court of appeal supreme court there you go so so for that to happen, uh, so, so the, the likelihood of something like that happening is very significant. I don't know if they've actually gone through and made the claim. Have they actually filed the complaint they in court? Fought, so what they did is they filed the notice of application. And if I'm recalling correctly, the federal court procedures requires the uh, government. Obviously, they're going to contest it. They have to file within a certain amount of time. I believe it's 20 or 40 days. Uh, so if the, Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it was May 26th, 2020, that the notice of application was filed. So from 40 business days, four business days or 20 business days from May 26th, they should file a defense, a notice of uh, that their intention to respond an by July. And from there, it's, they, they put together their bundles. Uh, we have our notice... I can show our audience members, but I can also, I'll also tell our audience members to Google it online. Uh, please forgive me, the, the uh, law firm from Calgary is watching. I believe it's Loberg Law or Lohmerg Law. Uh, they're the ones that filed the notice. You can read their full 54 page notice uh, with the case authorities that they cite, the Firearms Act. They include a lot of the arguments that our debaters have talked about. Um, sorry, Constantinos. 
that I was pretty much uh, summing it up there at the end. Yeah. And I think, so I think that the, the fashion in which this order in council was imposed, albeit uh, unnecessary because of its uh, lack of emergency on a state, on a, on a nationwide level, although it's been, although it's been uh, proclaimed as such, I don't think that the, the proceedings uh, were the one, were the, were done the way that they should have been. So and that, that's what I'm going to leave it at in terms of the order in council, whether it actually has an effect on cases such as this one that actually got it started. We Time mentioned earlier, it. it won't, it won't make a difference. And that's a sad fact. I, I wish these incidents never happened, but the, the, the idea that firearms are already in circulation, <clears throat> the creation of firearms have been around for a long time. And now to try and, and, and remove them all entirely from every hand, is an impossibility. There are ways to go about it. There are maybe amendments or changes that we can make in the process at which uh, gun ownership can be can be done and acquired in Canada. Because I think one of the issues is uh, mental health and mental illness. There isn't a mental health check. There isn't a psychological evaluation when it comes to firearm purchasing in Canada. And it's the same thing in the United States. There's a criminal background investigation, which is fair and, and fine. But if you don't have a criminal record and you pass uh, whatever checks the RCMP rate. then you're fine. But a lot of people, like the shooter in in uh, in the in the uh, mosque in in Quebec City a few years back, mm -hmm. had legally owned firearms, and he mm -hmm. was clearly, you know, for lack of a better term, unstable. Okay, I don't know uh, what we could classify him as, but it goes to show mm -hmm. that he sort of fell under the radar. And mm -hmm. so there are cases where shootings occur with legally owned guns. By legally own by legally legal owners, yes. and those go through the cracks. They fall through the cracks, sure. and and it's sure. sad to say that 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 happened. But that could have probably been prevented if there was a, a sort of a, a medical side or a psychological component to that investigation or to the process of actually acquiring those firearms. Okay. I mean, Nana, final uh, rebuttal point. No, well, all in all, I think, I think again, like I think Cosentitos makes a lot of good points um, and, and, and they're very hard to argue against. But I, and I get what he's saying about Australia and the UK. And eventually those countries did um, place a, a much, much stricter restriction on, on gun ownership. And I mean, they've been effective, right? Like there's no arguments that they have been effective. Um, obviously, um, they're not they're not totally effective because as we established, I mean, it's very hard to make something 100% effective. But um, coming back to the, um, the, the, the issue that he had raised about whether or not it was the right time to do it or whether or not it was done the right way, I, 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 will, I will, again, I will, I will say and I will relent in my, in my arguments that it definitely was not done the way that it should have been done. Um, that is an argument that I will definitely give you. But what I will say is, your um the prime minister took advantage of a situation that he had to do something that he felt was necessary to do um, is that the right thing to do is it the best thing for him to do perhaps not but i mean he had the ability to do that he felt like it was the right time and it was the necessary thing to do he had an opportunity and he took advantage of the opportunity it's I, I, while i don't agree with his methods i agree with his his um his results is, is what I'm saying in this particular instance. Um, what was the final point that you raised? I'm sorry, I missed that. I can't remember, I said a lot. <laughs> um, okay, well, um, with regards to uh, overall, like, gun, look, with regards to gun ownership, and you did say that you don't like to use the words all, but then you did use it when you were say, in your last um, monologue. But it, look, they aren't taking, in, in conclusions, they aren't taking all guns away, right? Like, I, I want that to be established as a thing that is happening. This thing isn't taking all guns away. And a lot of people are afraid because they're afraid that a lot of their guns are going to be taken away. Or this might mean that all guns will be taken away. But that's not what we're here to argue today. We're here to argue why is the government taking away these specific guns? Like Dan said a lot earlier in the, uh, in the argument, he said, one of the shooters in one of the sh shootings in the States had acquired an attachment that enabled one of these assault style rifles to become a far more effective killing weapon. And I, th and I think coming from my point of view that that was one of the reasons why this particular ban was put in place. It was to make sure that extensions or additions like those 
can't be put on weapons like these and used to commit crimes that would, you know, cause the death of a lot of Canadian citizens, as opposed to perhaps other guns that the government is allowing people to have, mm -hmm. which they can use for the things that are traditionally Canadian, like hunting or sports, and cannot be turned into, you know, for, <laughs> I, I don't want to use the word weapons of mass destruction or weapons of mass killings, but, but that's, that's basically what, what they're trying to do. So on a concluding note, 